Hi, this is Mac of MaxList. Find Your Dream Job is presented by MaxList, an online community where you can find free resources for your job search, plus online courses and books that help you advance your career. My latest book is called Land Your Dream Job Anywhere. It's a reference guide for your career that covers all aspects of the job search, including expert advice in every chapter. You can get the first chapter for free by visiting maxlist.org slash anywhere. This is Find Your Dream Job, the podcast that helps you get hired, have the career you want, and make a difference in life. I'm Mac Pritchard, your host and publisher of MaxList. I'm joined by my co-hosts, Lila O'Hara and Jessica Black from the MaxList team. This week, we're talking about tips for answering that popular job interview question, tell me about yourself. Often the first question you get in a job interview is this, tell me about yourself. How you answer can make a huge difference. Our guest expert this week is Carrie Twig. She says your response should be conversational, enjoyable, and above all, strategic. And you should practice your answer ahead of time. Carrie and I talk later in the show. For most of us, it's hard to ask others for help, especially during a job search. We may think our request will annoy others or people will think less of us. And often we apologize when we do ask. Leila has found an article that says we grossly underestimate how much others want to help us. And the author found there's a right way and wrong way to approach others. Leila tells us more in a moment. You're a recent college graduate with no industry or company experience. Should you apply for jobs that require two, five, or even more years of experience? That's our question of the week. It comes from listener Shiva Acharya in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Jessica shares her advice shortly. As always, let's check in with the MaxList team. And Leela, uh, welcome back. You had uh, some time off over the holiday weekend. I did, yeah. It was really great to get away from the office and just relax with my family. So it was a really good time. Yeah. Well, yeah. well we missed you last week, but I'm glad you had a nice break. Thanks. Yeah. Well, you're out there, and I know you didn't do this when you were on vacation. So no. No, you weren't looking around the <laughs> nooks and crannies of the desk. internet? Not, no. Yeah, not when I was out of the office, but I'm back back at it this week. So Yeah, so full disclosure, you actually did the research before you went on vacation, didn't yes, you? Yes, I did. Okay. Planned so t- ahead. Yeah, good for you. <laughs> well, what have you found for our listeners this week? So we all need help with our job search, but many of us really hate asking for help or we're reluctant to ask questions when we don't understand something. Maybe you think that you have a really silly question, or you just don't want to bother somebody to take time away from their busy schedule to help you. The Verge interviewed social psychologist Heidi Grant about why we wildly underestimate how willing and likely people are to help us. Heidi is the author of Reinforcements, How to Get People to Help You, and this interview is full of insights into why asking for help is something you should rely on and not be ashamed of. Heidi says that asking for help is a really big untapped resource. Many of us are afraid or ashamed to ask for help because we think people will think less of us. But Heidi counters this misconception and says that evidence suggests that people like us more for asking for help. Basically, the idea is, if I help you, I want to like you. We want to be consistent in what we do, so we believe that if I helped someone, I must like them. Heidi also points out that the common question, can you do me a favor, is not the right way to ask for help because it can easily seem manipulative or controlling. This question can lead to someone committing to help you before they really know what you're asking for. And by then, you've already made them feel obligated because they promised to do you a favor. Another misstep that people take is over-apologizing when they ask for help. This can make the person lending aid feel negatively, and it can rob them of their ability to enjoy helping if you're so entirely focused on your own guilt and shame about asking for help. Asking for help can sometimes make you feel vulnerable, especially when you're trying something new or if you feel like you haven't got a clue what to do next. But it's important to not be afraid or ashamed to ask for help, especially when you've hit a wall, um, either in your job search or just in any challenge you face. 
getting help from a colleague, friend, or mentor can unlock new solutions, boost your confidence, and give you more direction in your job search. Yeah, I think that's a really important interview to share. So I think that she shares a lot of really important te- tips about um, just going through it because it, it really is, I think, a, something that people sh- struggle with a lot, mm-hmm. asking for help. Yeah. Uh, and that vulnerability that you mentioned is something that I think everybody struggles with just in general in life, um, but especially in the job search because you don't. You don't want to let people know that you're struggling or mm-hmm. um, I think there's this common need to feel secure in, in everything that you're doing. Mm-hmm. And, um, it's a human need completely, but, uh, you know, asking for help. We hear it time and again in our, um, bonus episodes that we speak to job, um, folks in our community who have landed successful jobs and we have invited them back to tell us about their job search experience. And, um, often after they've been in the, the their career for about a year and they tell us time and again that you know being vulnerable and asking for help and um and reaching out to people is really what helps them be successful in that job search so it's really important to do that definitely yeah it's a good, excellent point and i know this is something as you say Jessica people struggle with i i, I think all of us around the table have at different Absolutely. points in our career because we think that People are going to say no, so uh, we don't want to. Uh, you are, as you say, making yourself vulnerable, and and we don't understand that people really are kind of wired to to want to help others. Yeah, yeah. You just have to make it easy for them to say yes. And uh, I especially like this the point in this story, uh, Leela, about uh, people not how they should avoid apologizing. Mm, for, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I yeah. I think. Uh, I think we've all done that. We've said, oh, I'm sorry, I don't want to be trouble. And uh, But it's, again, it gets back to the author's point uh, that people do want to help us. Yeah. yeah, it's all about just, yeah, being vulnerable and asking because people will um, most of the time just be really glad to, to help. So, yeah. yeah. I also yeah. really liked one last thing. I really liked her point about not saying, can I ask a favor? Yeah. Um, you know, asking for help, but, but phrasing it in a way that can be very... Um, two-sided and, and reciprocal. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. We, we've talked about um, how you get so much back when you give without expecting to get anything in return. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It, it's true. Well, excellent article. And uh, thanks, for, thanks for finding that, Leela. If you've got a suggestion for Leela, please write her. We'd love to share your idea on the show. And her email address is Leela at maxlist.org. Now let's ten, turn to you, rather, our listeners. Uh, Jessica Black is here to answer one of your questions. And I think uh, you were you weren't on vacation last week. Or you were. You were on I a stay also, vacation. Yeah. yeah. So you I got took the holiday week off, yes. Okay, good for you. Yeah. Uh, and I do remember that. Of course. Yeah. It feels, <laughs> we do work together. <laughs> that's right. It feels so long ago already, even though it was just a few days ago. I know. Yeah. Well, when you were digging around the mailbag before you left on your stay vacation, uh, what did you discover for our listeners? Um, yeah, I found um, a question from Shiva Acharya from Albuquerque, New Mexico. And he wrote uh, with the question about being a recent college graduate. So he writes, being a recent college graduate with no prior industry or company experience, it's quite frustrating when jobs require two, two to five or more years of job experiences. Is it still worth it to apply for such jobs, or shall I completely ignore these while searching for jobs online? Will employers completely cut out recent graduates for these kinds of jobs, or is there still a chance to be considered considered by them? So um, I really like this question because it can feel really frustrating and disheartening. I remember being in that position as well of feeling feeling like, I can't get experience until I get hired, but then they are asking for years of experience from the get-go. So what do I do? And so um, I just want to let Shiva know to not let this deter you because um, job uh, employers often use job descriptions as a wish list and um, they don't, ex- they don't expect their next hire to have all of the requirements all of the requirements that they list, but it's again sort of a wish list. So they're gonna they're gonna write down everything that they wish that they could have in their next candidate. But 
Um, I do encourage anyone, if you feel like this is the perfect position for you, still apply for it and you just never know. But you still do need to make the case for why you're the best fit. And so you need to make sure that you are identifying in your um, resume and application how your previous experiences have shaped you into this ideal candidate for the role that you're applying for. Um, So, you know, list all of the things that you've done, um, both in your college experience, jobs before college, internships, uh, volunteer experiences, things like that, whatever it is that is relatable to this position that you can, you can list that you have gained these skills and also showing that you are willing and able to learn. Um, but don't get too tied to the, to the actual years of experience because, you know, just sometimes you might get a break and they may, some employers may still, um, cut, cut folks out of that. And that's something that you can't get around, but you do need to, I would encourage anyone to still, um, try and still apply for things again with making sure that you're listing the, the ways that you are capable of doing this position and experienced in various ways, even if you don't have the years of experience. So the worst that can happen is that you don't get the job, but the best that can happen is that you do. So might as well go for it. What else would you guys say? Yeah, I would say that I've definitely been in that same boat, too, where you're trying to find a job, but you don't necessarily have the experience under your belt yet. And I think um, what I would suggest to Shiva is um, just think about all of the different kind of threads throughout your past experiences that you could um, showcase in the interview. So even if you don't have five years of experience working in the industry yet, maybe you've had two or three internships where you worked really closely with people in the industry and you learned a lot from those experiences, or maybe you've done some volunteering, um, or maybe you've done some kind of special um, side projects that um, would be really valuable to showcase. Yeah, Um, that's a good point. Yeah, um, I think it's hard because, yeah, you see that number and you automatically think, well, I'm not qualified for this. But if you kind of look at the full realm of your experience, there might be um, some great things to highlight. I think internships are the key here because you can say, uh, honestly, I've worked at this company or that organization uh, in, and that can, particularly today, many college students have two or three or even four internships. Yeah. And depending on, on the math that can add up to one or two years of experience. So, uh, Uh, You both made this point, highlight those internships, and uh, Leela, you made this even more emphatically, think about the outside experience that you might have through volunteer or uh, other work in that field that is uh, where the job is. And and that can can make, I think, a a big difference in the success of an application. Great. Thank you. Well, good luck, Shiva. Let us know how it goes, and we appreciate the question. If you've got a question for Jessica, send her an email. Her address is jessica at maxlist.org. You can also call her listener line. We actually haven't had a a call on our listener line for a while, so we'd love to hear from you. That number is area code 716-JOB-TALK. Or post your question on the MaxList Facebook group. However you do it, if we use your question on the show, we'll send you a copy of Land Your Dream Job Anywhere. We'll be back in a moment, and when we return... I'll talk with this week's guest expert, Carrie Twig, to get her tips about how to answer the tell me about yourself question. We all know that first impressions matter. And the very first thing a hiring manager sees is your cover letter. That letter gives you a make or break opportunity to wow an employer. Yet too many job seekers squander this chance. They send a cover letter with typos, sloppy format, or cut and paste text. And avoiding these rookie mistakes isn't enough to get you the interview. You also have to tell a compelling story. It all sounds complicated, right? In fact, if you follow a few simple rules, you can write a cover letter that stands head and shoulders above the rest. I've created a guide that shows you how to do this. It's called Simple Rules for a Winning Cover Letter. Inside, I explain the ideal content, structure, and style that appeal to hiring managers. 
and you get examples and templates to follow that you can use to write your own winning cover letter. Get simple rules for a winning cover letter today. Go to maxlist.org slash cover letter. Start transforming your cover letter today. Again, that's maxlist.org slash cover letter. Now, let's get back to the show. Now, let's turn to this week's guest expert, Carrie Twig. Carrie Twig is an international job search strategist. She helps people land their ideal jobs using their stories. Carrie has taught in universities, theaters, boardrooms, and even a boathouse. And she was recently selected as a top career expert to follow on LinkedIn by JobScan. She joins us today from the city of Winnipeg in Canada. Carrie, thanks for being on the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited about this conversation because uh, you've written some great uh, blog posts about how to answer the tell me about yourself question. And you've got some very practical tips. And this is obviously a question that comes up in almost any interview. Um, and so when you, let's step back before we get into those tips, Carrie. Uh, what, when candidates are, are uh, thinking about this question, what should they hope to accomplish when they give their answer? They really, um, well, it's the first question that gets asked. So it's really setting the tone for the entire interview. And I think what you want as a candidate is, is to think in your mind, um, you know, if I'm introducing myself and they're to know me as anything, what do I want them to remember me and know me as? Um, I think the other piece is having something, you know, that if, if somebody got called out of the interview after that question, that they would have like a sticky story that they could remember you by something that, um, the interviewer can imagine. So it's, it's, I think setting the tone, but putting something memorable and interesting in there. So it's, it's that important first impression. And I'm glad you brought up story because stories are sticky, aren't they? They're, uh, they stay with us long after we forget important data or statistics, don't they? It, yeah, exactly. And, um, and I think it's not just telling a story like I, you know, I, I fixed a filing system. But, you know, going into detail so that the people can imagine you doing the work, right? So even if it's like it was a filing system that was all paper in these old brown folders and then I created a new system with new, you know, colorful tabs and a matching system so that people, yeah, people can imagine it too. And that that's the, like the sticky part of stories. Yeah. And as you spoke there, I mean, you were creating images, I think, in uh, pictures in the minds of all of our listeners. And I know we're going to talk more about how to do that in a moment. Um, before we do so, I want to just ask you what might be an obvious question, but why do you recommend that people actually prepare an answer in advance and not walk into the interview room and wing it? Well, because usually if you think about what your nervousness or stress level is going to be, it's going to be the very highest at, um, at the very beginning. So if you have something that you are really confident in that you know, then at least you can trust yourself to, to deliver that properly. Um, you know, most of the people, when I first started teaching about job search, I worked with people who had experienced job loss. And I always felt like the, the, the most similar situation they would have had to a job interview would have been the day they got notified about job loss. And so what if all of those feelings come back and you kind of like, oh, no, I had this trauma um, and, and you just blank and you don't know what to say. So at least this, like this prepares you for knowing, knowing what to say. And you're in control of, of that first impression. So let's talk about preparation. And, and again, you've got some specific tips of things people should do when they answer, but uh, how, as they're doing the preparation, what, what should they be doing? Should they write a script, Ter uh, Carrie? Yeah. So I usually, I have like a blog post that, um, that maps it out. And when I'm working one-to-one -one with people, I'll give them a template. But the first step is, yeah, like just, um, just map it out, uh, write it all down. So what's your intro? What are some good stories? What words do you want to make sure that you're going to say? What words, you know, does the company have in their job ad? Um, or what asks are something that you might be able to incorporate into your tell me about yourself? Well, let's let's talk about those parts. And I again, you've got a series of articles on your blog about this that lay out five elements in the "Tell Me About Yourself" uh, question answer, uh, or answer to the question rather. Uh, let's let's talk about the first one, uh, and that's uh, what you call the introduction. Um, what yeah. should people include here? 
Uh, so your introduction, you're just giving, you're giving context for, for what you are, right? So if you're applying for a job and you're a graphic designer, then you're going to start off with like, I'm a graphic designer, um, you know, and letting people know how, how long you've worked in the industry and maybe a couple of things that you're, you're, that you've done. So it's pretty short. Um, but you're just, you're not starting. Some people start it with like, you know, I'm, I'm John and I'm a dad, right? And that's not what they want. It's about like who you are, but in relation to the job you're applying for. Okay. After that introduction, what's the next step? Then the next step is starting to talk about your super skills. So your super skills is letting them know, like, you know, so you start with your intro. So I'm a graphic designer. I've been doing this for 20 years. And the thing, and then the super skills. And what I'm really great at are, and then name, I would say up to three things that you're really great at. Um, and if, you know, if one or two of them are a little bit buzzwordy or a little bit, you know, overused and you have a good story to back it up, that's all right. But try and have one that is in like, it's like for me, I'll be like, it's a carryism. Like it's something only I would say. Um, you know, but try and have an, like so another word that is a little like that, that um, grabs their attention a little bit. And, and you know that no other candidate would be talking about. Can you give us an example of that, Carrie, of, of words that you've seen that kind of stand out, but uh, catch the, the attention of, of the interviewer? Oh, man. Well, I think it would. Yeah, it would be. Um, oh, man. No, I'm not going to be. <laughs> <laughs> How about a carryism? <laughs> yeah, a carryism. Any carryisms like, so come to mind? I, yeah, I would say like so. If I was doing, what are my like? What are my super skills? I would say the things that I'm really great are helping people, and lots of people have that. Um, my second skill is solving problems, and again, lots of people have that. And then my third skill is I'm really great at finding gaps in programs. And creating creating learning programs to fill those gaps. So I might say, like, my third skill is, um, oh, I'm not going to mess up my answer. <laughs> but yeah, but my third skill is is seeing those gaps and then coming up with programs that help them. And then I would go directly into an example. Okay. And is that example that you give, is is, is that the third part of the answer, which is telling a story? Yeah, then it just then you just move into backing it up because you can't really like introduce yourself and say I love to help people, I love to solve problems, and I like to address you know educational gaps, and then leave it there, <laughs> right? Because just because you say it doesn't mean that it's true, and you haven't you haven't proven that you have it. So then I would I would dive right into the next part, which is backing it up with a story. So, you know, if it was the filling the gap one, I would be like, you know, at the Winnipeg Art Gallery, you know, people didn't understand Inuit art. I created a program that taught about Inuit art. It raised the attendance by 50%. So I would tell, I would, you know, give a solid example that backed up that I had that skill. And that's something good writers do as well, isn't it? They, they don't tell the, the reader what they're doing. They actually show them, don't they? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And it's way like it's way more interesting to tell. So as as a person, like when you're prepping for your interview, it's more interesting to share stories that you love to tell. And it's way more interesting to listen to those stories, too. Well, there's a question that's on the mind of every interviewer when they're talking to a candidate, which is, why do you why are you leaving your current job? Uh, or yeah. what happened if if you're unemployed at your at your last position? And and that is the fourth element of the answer. You, you want to tell, tell us about that? Yeah. So it's your leaving story. And yeah, and, and you're right. Like, so that's the question. So if you know they're wondering why you would be leaving your, your job or why you're not employed, then you, you tell them. So if it's, you know, if, if your job, if you feel like you're, it's not meeting your needs anymore, you want a bigger challenge, or you've been there for 10 years and you're, you're scared of growing the segment, then that's what you can say, right? Well, I've enjoyed my time at ABC Company. You know, I'm now looking for a company that focuses more on and whatever that company does. Or if it's um, because of job loss, then you can... Like, then you can say, like, you know, while I was working at such and such company and I'm proud of the work that I did there, unfortunately, there was a restructure and, and my position was affected. At first, I, I found that really upsetting, but now I know what my super skills are and I'm excited to use them for you. 
Why is it important for the candidate to tell the story? Because some people, particularly those of us, and I, I number among this group who've been fired or laid off, we might we, we feel awkward and it's it's difficult to talk about. Why is it important for the candidate to to give an explanation? Well, because then you get to, you get to control the story of it and the dialogue, and it's not something to be worried about. So I'll have um, like we were working with clients, and they're like, "Well, what if they found out I lost my job?" And they're they're gonna find out. And so it's better for you to phrase it in the way that you want than to be worried the entire interview that that's gonna come up and how you're gonna answer it. So you're setting the tone. And and sometimes um, what can happen is that the energy. The energy can change in an interview. So you can be, you know, really great start. You'll be answering questions. And then all of a sudden the last question and they seem it casual, they might be casual and they'll say, yeah, so, you know, um, you know, when do you expect, when can you work? And then you go, well, immediately because I lost my job. That can be jarring because they might be thinking, oh, this is a employed person who's happy in their job. And it, and you don't want it to affect the decision, but. If that's really new, surprising information and they were seeing you in one light, that can be jarring. Um, and it's not that job loss isn't common or pe- like it's not acceptable. It happens so often, but you want to be in control of telling it. Yeah. I Before uh, starting MaxList, my career was in political communications. And what you're advising is something that elected officials and candidates do around the world, which is when there's a negative, acknowledge it. Um, give your explanation and then uh, move on to through what's called a bridging response to the story you want to tell. And if you watch public affairs shows on television or cable channels, you, you see political people do this all the time and it's uh, it works both on talk shows. And I, and I think it's probably very effective in interview rooms as well. Isn't it Carrie? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I didn't know it was a political move. I love it. (laughs) It's called bridging, but uh, bridging, yeah. yeah. Uh, but it, but it's the reason you want to do it is you you want to control the story, and and sometimes you you can't, but you but if you step forward and and do it in the beginning, the odds are that you're going to be much more successful at doing so. Exactly. Yeah. Well, uh, finally, there's the closer, and and this is the fifth of the five parts you recommend. Uh, tell us about that. So the closer is just like, just so it's not ending with like, and I lost my job and I'm excited to be here, but then telling the company specifically, like, again, if it hasn't come early, why, like, why you're excited about being there and, and being there for that particular role with that particular company. So it just, it just puts it in a nutshell and, and cleans it up. Good. Well, let's step back. So those are the the five pieces that make up this answer how long should this take a candidate to do all five of, of these things? Yeah, well, I think it depends. It depends on your career and it also um, depends on your and how, like, you know, if you like to talk about yourself and how long your stories are. So I would say the minimum is two minutes. Um, but I know people who have, you know, a five minute tell me about yourself. So it kind of depends on, on the job you're going for. If it's a place, like if it's a government role or like a crown corporation, like um, a utility place, like a place where you're getting points for your answers, where they really use that like, like BDI rating system and you get points for what you say, then it can be longer. If it's really casual, if it's a startup, there's no formal HR people, they might be a little weirded out if you go five minutes. So you want to adapt it, um, you know, for, for the role. And we talked a little bit about preparation. You recommended writing this out. Um, let's talk about how you do that. Uh, what, do you actually write a verbatim script? Do you use an outline or bullets? What do you see is, is most effective for the clients you work with? Yeah. So first, just writing it all out. And then, um, so I kind of, it, it's a, it comes from acting, but really write it all out and then take those pieces and even write it out on like index card and you can play around with the order. So just because I said, you know, you, you'd say your, you give a little bit of your career history here and then you go into super skills. Well, maybe like the, the way the flow of your stories, the way that they go that won't work for you, right? So maybe you're going to start with like an intro and then you're going to tell them, you know, you know, yeah, I lost my job. And then you're going to go into your super skills. So if you take out, um, like if you use index cards, you can play around with the order of them. 
And then, you know, from, from the index cards, see if you can think about the main idea you're trying to get across and just writing one word on your index card. So, you know, I might just have like three skills, right? And I'm not going to list what they are, but I'll have, you know, three skills. And then I'll be like, tell them the corn story, tell them the maze story, tell them the light story, um, and then the leaving story. And when you can start to talk it out, just by like those visual visual um, cues, then you know you're starting to get it. And then I really recommend um, recording yourself doing it. So I'll walk around with like my cell phone and just say it, right? This is my tell me about yourself or I'll go for a run and I'll say my tell me about yourself because then you get it like you get it in your body so that when your your brain is going to panic mode at the interview, you can trust that your body knows the script. It becomes almost like a muscle memory, doesn't it, if you practice it that much? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And by doing different things with it, because it, it's not about like it's not about memorizing it and then saying it in a really dull way. You want to say it as if you've never said it before. You just know exactly what to say. So it's you not only write this out, you but you record yourself listening to it, and then I, typically, how much practice should people? Uh, invest in in something like this like so for interview prep I think if you're doing it even a week before the interview you're in good hands um, going through this method and rushing through it and being really nervous a day or two before the interview um, can sometimes cause more more stress than just than um, yeah can can make you more nervous about trying to get it right than than it might be worth okay. Well, uh, that's terrific advice, Carrie. Now, tell us what's next for you. Oh man, well, I'm just um, I'm just coaching. So you know, <laughs> my favorite work. I know, just but my favorite my favorite work to do with people um, is is one to one coaching. So when you know whether it's resume or interview prep or figuring out how to use LinkedIn, you know, I'm just I'm I'm just taking clients for for one to one work. Well, terrific, and I. I know people can learn more about you and the services you offer by visiting your website. That URL is career-stories.com. You've also got an excellent series of, about these tips that we described, and we'll be sure to include both your website address and your blog post on this subject in the show notes. Gary, thanks for joining us today. Great. Thank you for having me. We're back in the Max List studio with Leela and Jessica. Uh, what were your reactions to my conversations with Carrie? Leela, what are your thoughts? Yeah, um, I thought she did a great job of breaking down why that question is so important because I think a lot of times you think, oh, I got that. Like I can just talk about my time in college or whatever. But how you answer that question can really set the stage for the rest of the interview. And I liked how she suggested talking about your super skills because – if you focus on like the two or three things you want to be remembered for, then there's a better chance of you standing out from the crowd versus telling a story about something random from your past. You know, I think it's important to be very strategic with that answer. I agree. It really does. It really is a really important story to tell at at any point in the interview, but especially at the very beginning and starting it out. And you don't want to get into it and be rambling yeah. or. Because I agree with you, it's easy to to go into it thinking it's my story. I know it like the back of my hand. I, I lived through it. It's I can do it anywhere. Um, but you, like she said, the pressure is on in those interviews, and you mm -hmm. really don't want to leave anything to chance because you really want to put your best foot forward, and you don't want to end up talking for five minutes unless you have a very polished story that that fills for a specific purpose, those exact five minutes, because I think, um, I think that was a really important, the, the time length that you guys talked about, um, is really important because it doesn't, I think it doesn't really matter how long it is, as long as it's tight and there's succinct and relevant information within that, inf that, um, length of time so that you, again, you're not rambling, um, and you're not telling any bits of information that are not directly, um, relevant to the, to the story and the position. Yeah. I, I like her strategy, the structure she provided and the examples. And, uh, 
in the, uh, her description of how to prepare the practice. I, mm-hmm. I liked that too. Yeah, and, yeah. and she has a, a theater background, as she mentioned, and, and that came through loud and clear because I've worked with speech coaches who come out of theater and one of the things they have you do is memorize sections of your remarks or your presentation So, and they have you practice it like a thousand times. So when you're nervous in front of a crowd or in front mm-hmm. of an interview panel, it is it becomes reflexive and, exactly. and it makes a big difference. It's huge because I liked your point about the muscle memory and having it be just a part of you because it does have this way of just lo- coming out of your brain even though you think that you have it and you have memorized it, but the pressure just makes it evaporate. But I liked also that she mentioned um, memorizing it, but also having kind of tying it to related specific words so that when you do have that pinch, you can say, I'm going to do the, I forget all of her things. The corn story. Yeah. I want to know the corn story. I know. (laughs) Me too. The corn story, the light story, the make story and the closer, whatever. Um, So tying it into those specific points is really important because that can help you. Um, we did that with, um, TEDx stories. You do the same thing of, uh, you tie it generally to your slides that you have, um, on stage. And so that really helps you so that you are memorizing, but that if you lose one of your lines, when you're memorizing that you don't have a panic attack, that you have lost everything, you can just get back right on track. Yeah. Good. Well, well, thank you both, and thank you, Carrie, for joining us this week, and you, our listeners, for downloading today's episode of Find Your Dream Job. Make the most of your next job application. Learn how to write a perfect cover letter. Get simple rules for a winning cover letter today. Go to maxlist.org slash cover letter. Again, that's maxlist.org slash cover letter. And join us next Wednesday when our special guest will be Carolyn Adams. She'll explain why you can't keep your options open when you look for work. Until next time, thanks for letting us help you find your dream job.